The Artie Shaw Band continues to tour under the direction of Dick Johnson, who is clarinet, lives in that tradition that Mr. Shaw established. And I've been tracking the Artie Shaw Band, and they've been tracking me. And uh, I've located uh, Dick Johnson and the Artie Shaw Band in Fort Wayne, Indiana. On Tuesday, the 13th of June, the Artie Shaw Band will be con completely... Uh, packaged uh, on location in the small and warm environment of the artist quarter at 26th and Nicollet, Minneapolis, believe it or not. And on the line is Dick Johnson, who has just come off a special one-night stand. Welcome into Minnesota Public Radio. How you doing, Ray? Doing just fine. Very nice, to, very nice to hear from you. We just got through a gig, and I'm pretty psyched up anyway. I usually am after a job, so... Well, while you unwind, I might uh, just uh, ask you about an experience. I'm thinking of um, Glen Island Casino mm. and the revival of the Artie Shaw Band uh, several years ago. You were in on that uh, very special occasion. I sure was. And um, uh, can you describe for us what that night was like? Well, it was unbelievable. Of course, we did have, that was the official opening, but we did have uh, three dates uh, prior to that. I think we played the University of New Hampshire and then in, in Pennsylvania and then we did one of the trade uh, buildings in New York where they had all the uh, all the big people around New York to visit. And then uh, the Glen Island Casino. It was unbelievable because it just uh, brought back the old days where I remember when I went to see the Artie Shaw Band or the Glenn Miller Band or Harry James, I spent the whole night uh, just staying at the back of the, you know, up near the stage trying to get to the front, and it usually took me till about the last set till I finally got up front. Well, that's what was happening at the Glen Island Casino. They were 25 deep, and of course, Artie was there himself. He stayed with us about a year and a half. The band is almost six years old right now, which I can't believe. But uh, he was there that night, and of course, everybody wanted to see him. He had been in retirement for so long, and it was just heartwarming. We were there for three nights. The first night uh, was just for, like, press, and then uh, there were another night and then they extended it for, for a third night because the uh, the uh, the turnout was so great and it was a, a real thrill for me because uh, it's a Cinderella story on my situation because I got in the business because of Artie and when I saw a second chorus uh, I think that came out in about 1941 that's the one that stirred, stirred me to uh, take up the clarinet and be a musician so it uh, goes a long way down the line with me. That's why I have such dedication for the band. I'm curious. Uh, you mentioned that that break-in date, uh, a series of dates uh, before the Glen Island Casino was at the University of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a different age group altogether than you had at the Glen Island Casino. Definitely. What uh, what kind of a crowd was it? Well, it, actually, there were some, uh, you know, there were some people up there that, that uh, knew about the date, so we did have people of the big band era age, but we did have an awful lot of college people because the uh, gentleman that hired us was the head of the music department up there. As a matter of fact, he's the head of the uh, Reed, you know, saxophone, clarinet, and flute, and all that department. And he put it on, so he had all his students. He said, I want you to come to hear this band because it's, the band was uh, happening years and years ago, but I want, Artie was the kind of a guy that he played 25 years ahead of his time anyway in his own playing, and the band was always way ahead of its time. And uh, so there was a mess of students there, and they couldn't uh, get over. Some of them did meet Artie themselves, and they were completely taken by surprise by the band because the band was so young. Other than me, I'm not young, but the side men with the band and uh, the uh, the college uh, kids could identify with that and uh, talk to all the different side men and talk to Artie and who Artie know. And it was just a uh, yeah, that that was I can I can remember it because it's the same. It's weird. It's the same uh, day as my anniversary. It was December ninth, nineteen eighty three. And I think we opened the Glen Island Casino something like the uh, 12th or something like that, the 11th or 12th of December in 1983. But the uh, University of New Hampshire was just a, it was very historical. We do have a tape of that night that somebody somebody had taken, given us, so it's the first, the band was a little rough at the edges, but it still had an awful lot of spark. And then over the, you know, after about a, oh, a few weeks or so, we were really polished, and it's become more and more polished ever since. Well, Dick Johnson, uh, something uh, 
it strikes me that's very important, at least for this uh, locale. You've had some Minnesotans in your band who come out of uh, Dr. Frank Ben Crusciuto's University of Minnesota Jazz Ensembles, Dave Sletton for one, and uh, you have Mike Paulson on your band, don't you? Right, we've got Mike Paulson uh, right now, and as a matter of fact, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's made so much, he's played great ever since I've heard him, but he's made so much strides in the last year. He's He's a very dedicated musician, and he he spends a fortune on records and tapes and everything, and he knows more trivia, it seems, of jazz and all the big bands than I do, and he's only a kid, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, just lately, he's uh, his soloing is just awesome, really. He's he put an awful lot of time into it, and he's become a fantastic lead trombone player, which is an art in itself, plus being a great jazz player. And actually, that's what the band has. Each chair in the band, Artie said, you know, uh, I just soon have a good jazz player if we can get one in every chair in the band, so I can go around to everyone in the band and point to them and have them get up and take a solo, and they're all excellent. But Mike's something special. And of course, we just uh, we just lost. Uh, he was with us for about a year and a half. Steve Picard from uh, Minneapolis. I don't know if you know him, Ray, but he's another fantastic trombonist from Minneapolis, and he just left the band uh, in a matter of a, a couple of weeks ago. And he's he's another one. He he's a young guy, but he he plays with Dixieland groups and bebop groups and more. So he he spans about fifty, sixty years himself, and he's only in his uh, well, I would say you know mid twenties or something like that. And uh, I think there was another trombone player we had the band from Minneapolis. I think it was, uh, Rainier, Jeff Rainier. Does that sound familiar to you? Yes, it does. And uh, he's another one that's for some reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, Minneapolis has really got some great trombone players up there. There's three of them right there. And then there was, uh, let me see, uh, a trumpet player that was with us just for a couple of years, uh, Dave Jensen. Surely, and Dave... Dave, Dave. He, just, he just left us a little while. I say these people leave us, but naturally guys do go on the road and they have families and everything. So they might, some might stay three years, some might stay two, some might stay one. It all depends on what their domestic situation is. And... Uh, but Dave, uh, Dave was with us for about, I guess, a, a year, a year and a half. And he's a phenomenal trumpet player. So we had a, you know, every once in a while, when you start getting one gentleman from, uh, from a certain locale, uh, when somebody leaves in the band, maybe somebody suggests somebody. So you, all of a sudden you start getting a lot of people from one area. And that's, I guess, how that started. And of course, you, they have to be very well qualified in which they are. So. Minneapolis and St. Paul, I guess, can be do themselves very proud of having such great quality musicians. And of course, that's a credit to the University of Minnesota Music School, I, mean, I yes. think. Uh, Dick, um, just for all of us, uh, looking back to the organization and reorganization and debut of the Artie Shaw Orchestra, what did you and Artie Shaw talk about when you were putting this project together? Well, I guess he, uh, one of the things I just mentioned, we just soon have like uh, everybody be a good jazz player. And then he, uh, he, you know, naturally went into length uh, why he got out of the business years ago. And, uh, of course, uh, that's why he, he couldn't go ahead. I remember seeing the band, uh, his last band, which was 1949 and 50, and he had Al Cohn and Zoot Sims and Johnny Mandel and all oh, you know, he had like, uh, un unbelievable bebop band, uh, back there, and the people were booing and hissing him. I saw the band, it was one of the best bands I had ever heard in my life. I was completely knocked out by the band, and he couldn't do anything with it because he was cursed with all those, uh, well, it's not a curse because they were all great tunes, but he couldn't get out of that Begin the Begin and Moon Glow and Stardust, which naturally those are phenomenal things, But uh, and he always would play them, but he wanted to branch out along with those things. I mean, I talk about those tunes, I'm certainly not knocking them, those are some of the best musical things in the world, especially Stardust, by the way, that was just inducted into the Jazz Hall of Fame uh, about a year ago, I think. And that was Billy Butterfield's solo. Butterfield played the trumpet solo, and Jack Jenny played the trombone solo, and of course, Artie's chorus with clarinet players, that's just a, a legend in itself, anybody that's heard that, so the uh, different people will describe it as being one of the best jazz pop things of all time. Artie made a great uh, uh, observation when he was on Johnny Carson's show, not long before I met him, and uh, this was maybe uh, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago or so, he was on with Buddy Rich, and they were 
but he was probably you know sort of goading him why did he quit the music business and all that. But then Artie went in length about how lucky uh, we were at the one time when the big band situation had all a lot of them had all some of the best jazz players with them because it was so you know the big band era was uh, was so big and in other words like it was uh, sweeping the country with swing and jazz and everything else and he said it was an eclipse it was uh which probably would ne maybe never happen again but what happened is like all these great musicians were with the band and then the masses all the people not just a few people now the trickle of people that love jazz and love the big band but all almost everybody was into big bands and you could stop somebody on the street and ask him who was playing second tenor for Gene Krupa or third trumpet for Tommy Darcy or, you know, who the two tenor players were with the Count Basie band and people knew. And he said that was the eclipse and all of a sudden it sort of hit all the people and the people were all digesting this phenomenal music and then it sort of left, you know, like in the 45 and 46 and when the, uh, of course the recording band didn't help anyway. That was the most, probably the most idiotic things of all time that that could have happened that uh, they put uh, the musicians into that where they re didn't couldn't record for three years. I never, you know, it's almost like he was on uh, somebody else's side. But I think it probably would have happened anyway. It would have sort of moved on even without the, uh, even if the recording band did not happen. But that was a very um, interesting thing, the, the way he put it. I never heard anybody quite put it that way, and that's the truth. I mean, everybody in in the world really was into the big bands and the jazz players with the big band, whether they knew it or not. They And uh, then it sort of just veered away, and we might never see it happen again. We'll always see some some of it. And, of course, uh, it is America's classical music, is the big band era and jazz. So there we have it. We talked a lot about that. Artie even talked about uh, trying to change the word from jazz. He just didn't like the name. You know how you, different names come up, bebop for an era, and... Yes, and I guess he had met with quite a few uh, aficionados, of, uh, and they thought, but there's no way you're going to, once you name something jazz, that's it. How are you going to get away from it, you know? Well, Duke Ellington sort of voted along with Artie Shaw on that score. That's right. I, I read about that myself. There was quite a few of them to change it. But, you know, still, it's 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 like ain't, you know, the people would say, <laughs> ain't's finally in the dictionary, because people use it so much that it finally gets accepted. I'm sure it isn't accepted in, uh, like, a presidential speech or some big rhetoric that somebody said they're not going to use ain't, but it's used so much that it's just like a accepted, uh, ex well, with the exception of, of, of doing speeches or things on the radio or something like that. But uh, exactly what jazz is. So, um, I mean, actually, if I say, you ask a guy how he plays, well, he's a great jazz player. Well, I guess you're not going to stop anybody from saying that we're so used to it. But he's always, uh, you know, he always was a nitpicker and a perfectionist and trying to get the right word for something. You know, and uh, it was a real, it's a real pleasure knowing him because I, we, I talked to him about once every two weeks, just called him on his birthday a few a few days ago. And he's really in great spirits. A lot of people think he's gone. You know, I have to announce in a lot of places that, uh, that he's still alive. And a funny situation happened a few weeks ago. We were on the road and we had some... Uh, leaflets that were put out about the band is in the Audi Shaw band under the direction of Dick Johnson will appear such and such a gig at such and such a time and went into talk about Audi Shaw and then it said the untimely death of Audi Shaw in 1988 shook the shook the people <laughs> I read this thing I said where did they get their information he's very much alive I just talked to him this morning you know so well, I'm glad you underscored that <laughs> Dick Johnson, um, Minnesota Public Radio here, and you and Fort Wayne, Indiana, are leading the Artie Shaw Band to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the Artist Quarter at 26th and Nicollet, and I know you'll be arriving on Tuesday, mm -hmm. June 5th, uh, 13th, rather, right. and uh, we'll look for you on that one-night stand, and thank you for your observations and insight, and for preserving that marvelous Artie Shaw book. Well, that's what I live for, really. <laughs> well... We look forward to hearing you alive and in person. Oh, that's great, Lay. By the way, the name of that uh, that disc jockey that was on that tape that you have is Fred Cole. Bro broadcasting by way of Boston. Right. Let's uh, go back in time to the year 1938 and uh, capture the Artie Shaw band that really impressed Dick Johnson, who now leads it and is the clarinetist who represents Artie Shaw. Thank you very much, Dick. Thanks Good talking Ray. with you. It's really been a pleasure.